You're listening to Patriot Radio on The Real Deal with Dr. James Fester, hosted by Gary King. And tonight we've got Larry Rivera, our special guest host, and he's going to be in the driver's seat. He's corresponded with Steve Martin, who is the son of the legendary Shirley Martin, who was on the case almost from day one. So I'm going to turn it over to Larry. Thank you so much for being on The Real Deal, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, this is Larry Rivera, your host tonight on The Real Deal with Jim Fetzer and Gary King. Once again in the driver's seat talking about the JFK assassination. Tonight we have a very special guest. His mother was and is one of my heroes in JFK research. She was a housewife bringing up four children in Hominy, Oklahoma. A pioneer in the JFK investigation who was on the scene in Dallas within days of the assassination to find out and investigate for herself. Ladies and gentlemen, I am talking about the legendary Shirley Martin, and we are honored to have on The Real Deal my very special guest, a person who seldom gives out interviews and is never in the limelight, Shirley's son, Steve Martin. Steve, welcome to The Real Deal. Thank you, Larry. Steve, uh, before we get into uh, the incredible stories and anecdotes I'm sure you have been privy to in all these years, uh, please tell us a little bit, a little about you. Well, you know, the, I, I grew up in Hominy, Oklahoma, <laughs> after moving from Honolulu with my mother, and my mother was always uh, on the cutting edge of things, I guess. She was, before the Kennedy assassination, she was very deeply involved in the uh, civil rights movement. And I was, and probably still am, I, I don't know if I still hold the record, I was the youngest white member of the NAACP uh, ever in Oklahoma. And uh, that's something I'm very proud of. We were... You know, you know, we were we picketed bowling alleys, we picketed restaurants, we uh, we were in on the segregation of the Borden's cafeteria chain uh, in Oklahoma. Um, things that I'm proud of, even before uh, my mom was involved in, in the Kennedy assassination, that it, it kind of set the stage for for that. I believe she was just a, a very progressive person, very progressive person, and in Hominy, Oklahoma, um, we stood out. Uh, it was a population 2,000, very, well, what you would expect politically of, of uh, small-town Oklahoma. Uh, she also ran, was the chairman of the uh, elect Kennedy uh, head, uh, campaign headquarters in Hominy. I remember there not being much of a brisk trade um, going in and out of there. So it was, a, it was an interesting upbringing even before the Kennedy assassination. Yes, uh, we're talking about rural Oklahoma in the 1960s, uh, and you were homeschooled, uh, is that correct? That's correct. We, we came from Honolulu, where my dad had been manager of the Honolulu International Airport, and uh, he decided to give that up, a mistake, uh, you know, in, in retrospect, and become, and join a, a friend of his, a college friend of his in Oklahoma who was... Uh, what today they would call an entrepreneur, what we would call in those days um, a shady businessman, probably. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a kind of a get-rich-quick scheme, I think, for my dad. And um, there was money involved, and his boss did get very rich, but it, none of it seemed to trickle down very much. But that was why we moved to rural Oklahoma, and it was a shock for my mother. Uh, we had been private schooled in, in, in Hawaii. Um, and coming to the Hominy school system was um, a, a major culture shock for my mother. Okay. And after, fir after first grade, she took us out and uh, homeschooled us. And homeschool consisted mostly of uh, riding horses and uh, having my mom tell us about philosophy and literature and history. Um, and we learned so much from her just from those verbal interactions because she was one of the most she wasn't a college educated woman but she was the most intelligent woman i've ever known and uh unfortunately she wasn't very good in math and i <laughs> we we all suffered for that over the years when we did start going back to school in college etc but it was it's still an interesting time wow tell us about your siblings your brothers and sisters uh, my sister Victoria, Vicky, um, was um, is the one that passed away, and I think we'll probably talk more about her later. Yes. Um, and then my sister Teresa, uh, who still uh, lives in Oklahoma, and I had a adoptive brother, Michael Jockaway, who was a full blood Choctaw Indian. He too has passed away. Um, too young, 
Um, and we spent a lot of time. We were very isolated. Our nearest neighbor was a was a cemetery. We spent a lot of time, you know, riding horses and um, wandering the the eighty acres that we had, and uh, just enjoying life. I remember I was uh, when when Kennedy was assassinated, and we heard it on the news. Uh, I was trying to study mathematics on the floor in front of the TV, which is probably not the best place to do it. Oh. That's, uh, that's exactly what I was going to get into next. Uh, now, after the assassination, uh, your mother is known to have loaded you guys into the, into the car and driven all the way to Dallas from Harmony. Uh, what are your recollections of uh, these long trips? I mean, because I know it must have been a very long trip uh, for you guys, especially uh, the young ones. Yeah, it was um, longer than it is now I mean, because it was all too right. lame back then. And... Um, uh, we would, she would use the time to talk about, again, I'd talk about history and um, yeah. literature and, and and talk about the Kennedy assassination. You know, from the minute she saw Lee Oswald being paraded in front of the news cameras, I remember her shaking her head and saying, something's not right, something's not right. And then when he was murdered, um, that became even more clear to her that something was wrong. I mean, it was it was textbook perfect that you know that he would have to die <laughs> and uh, at that moment she became completely completely uh convinced that something was wrong didn't know what but she was damn well going to find out now, now these were sort of like field trips and uh, which were part of your education uh that's what we called them yes um we it was it was probably more because uh, we didn't have school so that we were we were always together, and so where my mom went, we went. Right, right. Now, uh, your mother is known to have engaged many of the witnesses in Dallas, even before the Warren Commission sent out investigators. Uh, can you tell us some of those witnesses that uh, where she got there before anybody else? Well, I know that uh, we were probably there, I think the first trip was probably February 64, so a couple of months, two or three months after the assassination, long before the Warren Commission was taking testimony. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we were not always together, but um, I do remember that uh, she um, did speak with Akilah Clemens, uh, she spoke with Helen Markham, um, we spoke with... Uh, Nick McDonald, she's, we, uh, and some of the names are escaping me a little bit at the moment, but um, any of the witnesses that she felt were relevant, uh, mm -hmm. Mormon, Hill, uh, she tracked them down and, and interviewed them. Oh, but also uh, the Paynes, Charles Brem, I know that she uh, spoke to uh, both Ruth and Michael Payne. Right. And, uh, which were extremely important re uh, witnesses here, and she seemed, yeah. seemed to have a nose for, you know, to really get close to a lot of these people. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Yeah, I certainly uh, remember Ruth Payne. Yeah, right, right. Now, another thing uh, that she did, which was important, were, were uh, reenactments and pictures and surveys and that kind of thing. Uh, what, uh, what's your opinion about that? We spent a lot of time uh, walking the routes, um, timing them, um, we visited um, the Beckley Street apartment and interviewed the, uh, the I guess he was the landlord. Uh, yeah, Arlene Roberts, yeah. Yeah, but it was a gentleman we were talking to, so it may have been her husband. Okay. I don't remember. It was a man we were talking to, I believe. Okay. Uh, and I, I remember that pretty clearly, and I remember that there were curtain rods <laughs> in, yeah, right, right. in the bedroom, so that was one of the things we were looking for. And as my mother was leaving, because uh, uh, there really wasn't much to say. I mean, they didn't really know anything. But as my mother was leaving, she turned around and said, Did you like Lee? Um, and he kind of paused and and said, Yeah, he was a good tenant. He, he never any trouble. Never any trouble. Very interesting. Uh, uh, you mentioned the uh, 1026 Beckley uh address and it's very interesting because Gary and I just a couple of months ago visited that site and we actually went and walked the uh, from the 500 block to the rooming house 
and we actually timed it to find out how long it would have taken somebody who was walking at a brisk, brisk pace to get there, and it came out to eight minutes and 37 seconds. You know, and it's very, very interesting uh, that when you visit and you see uh, the topography and you see the layout, uh, it's sort of totally different from uh, what is reported. Uh, well, my memory uh, of it is that the timing did not work out well. Right. Um, right. And I don't remember the, you know, the details of that, but I do remember that the timing did not work out. And that was one, and in fact, my father, who was never really into this like my mother was, he was a businessman, and I think kind of worried about, you know, the implications it might have on his career, such as it was. Well, right. um, he did accompany my mother and us occasionally, and he, um, before I forget this, he actually talked his way into the book building um, with Roy Truly. And, in fact, it was he and my sister Vicky. And one of the stories that, that was used quite often um, with different witnesses with it was that my sister Vicky was writing a children's book about the assassination. I, I can't quite picture that, but uh, it was used. And, and that's what that story, along with $20, um, got Vicky and my father Mark into the book building. They wow. did not get to go up to the sixth floor, but he took them, uh, you know, the tour of downstairs, the lunchroom on the second floor, I believe it was. Um, and, you know, nothing again of terrible interest, just that it was still an active business at yes. that time. And now it's a museum. But he did get to go into it, and it was very unusual for anyone to get into the book building back then. Well, you know, I wonder what your mother would say now about uh, all of the uh, new information that has been revealed by uh, researchers like Bill Weston about the background of the company, the TSBD company, and uh, the right-wingers who were who owned the company and who moved the, uh, the TSBD company into that building precisely in the summer of 1963, which in itself has become a very, very uh, uh, contentious uh, point right now. Uh, because they, and very suspicious actually because uh, most people think that they had resided at that address at 411 Elm Street all along and it's, it's just not like that at all and, uh, and now that you mentioned Vicki uh, uh, who how involved was she uh, was your older sister in JFK research was she as passionate as your mother and what was she like she was every bit as passionate I mean she was an adult a young adult but she was an adult uh, the rest of us were, you know, 10, 12, 13, you know, that sort of thing, um, during that time frame that my mother was actively involved in this. But Vicky was an adult and um, was very much like my mother, although she was kind of a stabilizing influence where my mother was kind of... Uh, my mother always had a problem with petty authority. And um, I think some of the memos that you sent and that I've looked over pretty much solidify that. And my sister was kind of a, a stabilizing force there, I think. She was very level-headed and calm, and uh, she did a lot of the transcriptions of, of interviews, and she also was the one that more, more often than not um, carried the tape recorder. Well, for our audience, uh, I just wanted to uh, make our audience aware that Vicky was, what, 21 years old when this was going on? Uh, you know, I'd have to actually do the math, but I think Vicky was 21 when she died, so she was probably 18-ish when this started. Okay, okay. Um, but still very poised, very adult-like, and, you know, very bright, like my mom. So I must have missed out something in the genetics. <laughs> well, uh, they were both very beautiful, I'll tell you that, from the pictures that I have seen. Uh, okay. Now, in March of 1964, uh, your mother wrote an article or a paper that I that I have a copy of, and she sent it to the FBI. It was titled "FBI Fiction or Common Sense Fact," and I sent a, you know, I sent you a copy of this. And in this paper, your mother actually compared Lee Oswald's upbringing with that of Barry Goldwater. Were you surprised uh, to read uh, what she had to say about this? You know, when I saw, I had completely forgotten that this existed, and when I saw it, uh, it brought back some memories of it. Uh, and this was typical Shirley Martin. Right? This was, um, she was, uh, she she was often into kind of a shock value, um, mm -hmm. and to get reactions from people. And when you when you read the the article that she wrote or the letter she wrote, I guess is what it was. Yeah. It's she's right. 
I mean, I, when, you look at the, when you look at the details of it, she is absolutely right that Lee Oswald um, was not a metal case. And one of the things that, you know, sounds odd to say it, but Lee became more than the alleged assassin to us. Um, he became a real person. And, you know, we never called him, you know, we never called him Oswald. We never called him Lee Harvey Oswald. We always called him Lee, and still too to this day, when, we're, when my family's talking about him, we always call him Lee, because he became a person to us, not just a, you know, not just this sinister figure that allegedly killed this beloved president. And it angered her uh, deeply. She, she became very maternal, I think, uh, you know, about Lee. And um, she felt that he had been you know, terribly abused in the system. Um, you know, whether he was guilty or not, he was never given a fair chance to, after he was arrested, it, it, it was over for him. And that angered my mother, and I think that after we got to know Lee's mom so well, um, they became, she became almost a surrogate mother to Lee. And almost as if he were part of our family and i even still today i'm very protective of of lee's image um because i do not believe he killed kennedy and um right so and, and it's very pointed what it what you have just uh, related here to us uh, it's very very impressive uh <laughs> wow now uh now uh, what what uh, when the fbi started to become aware of, of your mother and what she was doing in this campaign. Uh, what, what was uh, the FBI's opinion of her at the time? Well, I know that uh, I was reading that same letter that you were talking about a moment ago, fiction uh, or common sense fact, and um, it, was, it became pretty obvious that for whatever reason, you know, Hoover was a strange man and he, he focused in on, he was always part of everything. He, he knew everything that was going on. You know, he was, he had his, you know his thumb on everything and i can't imagine that the uh, my mom's reference to hoover in this fbi fiction or common sense where she says uh using the leaked fbi report as a source of reasoning are we to conclude that mr j edgar hoover considers barry goldwater a possible paranoid <laughs> mr j edgar hoover considers barry goldwater a possible assassin Mr. J. Edgar Hoover considers himself a possible source of danger to the government. Are there not some interesting psychological symbols extant in Mr. Hoover's life? I mean, you know that had to make him mad. I mean, I, um, you know, there is the, the um, memo that he wrote about my mom at one point calling her a, a bright nut, possibly a mental case. Right, right, right. And I've always, um, it's probably politi politically incorrect to say this now, but I've always imagined him writing that memo in a sequined evening gown and high heels. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. Uh, and, you know, yeah. he was definitely, uh, yeah, and that quote, of course, a bright nut, came directly from Ruth Bain. Right. And I don't, I don't know if you were aware of that, but when the, uh, after the first visit to Ruth Payne's house, she reported directly to Hostie, Let's talk about Ruth Payne. Let's talk about Ruth Payne and Michael Payne. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Ruth Payne, um, after that, like I said, after that first visit, uh, she reported directly to Hostie, uh, who was somewhat infamous in the Oswald case already. Of course. And, he call, and she called my mother a, an intelligent, uh, I think she said, an intelligent nut, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, Hoover's quote was almost verbatim. And it always seemed odd to us that Hoover got his, his information from a civilian, although I'm not sure how civilian we can really call Ruth Payne. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because at the very least, she was a, um, a serial FBI informant. Well, I would uh, I would go a little bit uh, one step further, uh, you know, with uh, the evidence that was uncovered there that was suppressed for so long, uh, where she had these file cabinets full of uh, dossiers on the people in Dallas who were uh, helping the Cubans and that that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, her, her sort background makes one, is right, yeah. Right, her sort of makes one think is about definitely it. not terribly innocent, I would say. Right, right. And nor her, 
apprenticeship or whatever it was uh, with, you know, with DeMora Schultz. But, you know, that could go on and on. But just on a personal level, she terrified me. Um, I remember going into her house at least on two occasions, maybe more, um, and she seemed this very... She, was a, she frightened me as a child. Uh, she was tall. Uh, she was kind of harsh. Uh, never anything that she said outwardly was, was, was scary. But there was just a vibe about her that was weird. And her demeanor. I, yeah, her demeanor. And, and I certainly remember her taking us into the garage and showing us where the rifle had been laid out. And again, you know, this was, you know, just months or so after the assassination, so everything was still as it was then. Um, and showing us where the blanket with the wrapped rifle had been on the shelf. And you know, those kind of things are interesting. And I remember Michael Payne being just silent much of the time. Yeah, I, I uh, read uh, that uh, he, uh, on one occasion, he showed up uh, while your mother, while you people were there. and uh, Ate a TV uh, dinner. Oh, wow. <laughs> while we were there. He, Ruth made him a TV dinner, and he just ate it and watched us. Um, he was not into it. I, you know, he was not into it. He was worried about the whole thing, I could tell. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. so but Ruth Payne, um, you, you know, is... Uh, and I, I'll have more to say about her a little later, but um, Ruth Payne was a, he was an interesting woman. I, I, I believe she's still with us. Um, yes, yes, she's, uh, I, in a sense, she's living in a, uh, an old folks' home in California. Oh, uh, really? Near San Francisco, yeah. It's like the last time I heard anything about her, she was in Florida, but I could be wrong about that, too. Yes, yeah, she has been in Florida, but now she's uh, she's in, uh, like I said, an old folks' home in, uh, mm -hmm. I believe, the San Francisco area. I would suspect that Michael is long gone. No, no, I believe Michael is still, uh, still around. Oh, is he? Okay. Yes, yes. Well, and no, their, their, son, their son Christopher, I believe, uh, takes care of them uh, out there. I wrote her a letter... Uh, a number of years back now that I had no response to and in reference to something that was said about my mom and uh, and we'll talk about this later too because I know you you had mentioned it earlier um, sure. no no you can lay it all out uh, you know it's, it's quite fine with me uh, uh, well uh, you know the, my sister uh, there have been rumors throughout the years that my sister death was something other than an accident right uh, and most of this came from Ruth Payne and I don't really I never was able to really trace why Ruth Payne had that information or why she thought that or why she felt it important to tell people I think the last time I saw her mention it was in that book that terrible book Ruth Payne's Garage okay um, I think it was in there um, and that was when I wrote to Ruth, and I asked her if you if you wouldn't mind just stop saying this about my mom. It's you know it's not important anymore. Just stop, you know. Um, but I have read that many places, and I've been asked right. about it a couple of times. And right. um, you know, you couldn't have been friends with Tim Jones without being somewhat paranoid about the whole situation. Oh yeah. And there was reason to be. I mean, there. Uh, there was, you know, there was definitely intimidation going on at the time. Uh, I think the visits to my mom by the FBI were intimidation tactics. Um, other people, like Mark Lane, were openly harassed. Um, and I believe that at the time my sister died, I think that my mom may have said, and maybe to Ruth, because, you know, they corresponded and spoke quite often. Uh, I don't think they were friends, but they kept in touch. And she may have said something to Ruth like, God, I hope it wasn't because of me, uh, or something along wow. those lines. Wow. Uh, and from that point on, it became, you know, the rumor spread that she thought that Vicky had been uh, killed as part of the conspiracy. And, you know, Vicky and, and the driver of the car lived for several days. Yes. Uh, and, and we were able to talk to them. And it was... It was the drivers of the, you know, her friend's fault. Um, she reached down and picked, to pick, she had her purse fell on the floor and she reached down to pick it up. And they swerved over and hit another vehicle head on in the other lane. And they were in a Volkswagen, um, right. which, you know, no front engine and, you know, there was just no contest. But, you know, there was nothing ever 
<laughs> I'm not saying there were no mysterious deaths during that time, because I think there were. Um, but my sister wasn't one of them. She was just in an accident, and she died. Wrong and, place uh, in the wrong time. Yeah, and of course, you know, my I, I think it did cross my mother's mind a time or two, you know, could this have been, you know, a warning to me about... You know, and I don't remember the details of this, but several weeks or months, I think, probably more like months before, she had received a letter from a woman in France. I have no idea who it was. I don't think she knew who it was. It was just a woman who had come across her name in reference to the Kennedy assassination in some way. And she had written a letter to my mom, and in it she said, Aren't you afraid? Aren't you afraid that something might happen to one of your children if you don't stop? Wow. And... You know, that, I think, was probably in the back of her mind a little bit, too. But did she think that my sister's death was the result of a conspiracy? Maybe in one of her weakest moments, it crossed her mind. But she never, you know, as, as time went on, she never thought it seriously. I mean, we knew too many facts about the accident. So, that's that. Uh, just dumbfounded here. And, uh, I, I just thought it was hurtful of Ruth Payne to continue to talk about that. Um, when, you know, even if it, even if it had been true, I think it was hurtful, uh, yes. and it was deme and it was demeaning. You know, to think that, you know, you know, one of the things that killed the Kennedy assassination research, I think, was that there were so many people with so many theories that eventually the, you know, the CIA and the FBI, they just kind of said, okay, well, let them kind of implode, right. you know, let them destroy their own credibility by coming up with wilder and wilder theories because it was that was the only way to sell books anymore you know well well also steve uh the uh concept of uh, some of these so-called researchers running li what we call limited hangouts is also has also uh you know been a concern where uh, a lot of the this disinformation or misinformation has been purposefully uh brought out precisely uh, for this, what, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and I think some of the wilder theories were, were that, too. Let's, let's just make them seem ridiculous. You know, mm -hmm. let's say that it was Nixon. Let's say it was LBJ. Let's say it was Castro. Let's say it was the uh, mob. Um, and they, the books got farther and farther away from the facts, you know, the photographs of the time, the, the people, the witnesses, the eyewitnesses to the case. And it got more and more into this kind of wild speculation, mm -hmm. and I think that's the main reason that you know the uh, critics became so laughed upon after a while. Well, I, w I want to touch a little bit upon those critics because uh, it seems like your mother was in touch with uh, the very, very best researchers, and the uh, and uh, you mentioned Penn Jones, but I also want to mention Mark Lane. Uh, with whom uh, she established uh, uh, a very yeah, close relationship. Family, yeah. Harold yes, Weisberg. Ben Jones. Yeah, Sylvia Marr, and particularly Harold Weisberg, because a lot of these documents that I've been sending you have, have come from his, his website. Both of and, them, uh, Harold Feldman and Weisberg. Yes, yes, right. And, uh, and they, and they uh, after a while, they actually depended uh, quite a bit on, on your mother's investigations and in, in your mother's work. Yeah, she was never interested in, she never wrote a word for profit, although she was an excellent writer, uh, but she was interested in funneling this information uh, to these right. other people, many of them who now claim that it was their information originally, by the way. Right. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't yeah. matter anymore, but Mark Lane has a tendency to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but that's okay. I mean, it's a lot of time has passed, and um, it sounds petty to... To point out some of those things now, so well, I understand that Mark <clears throat> Mark Lane uh, actually dedicated one of his books uh, to your sister. Citizens' Descent was dedicated to Vicky. Right, right. Uh, that's very. And I was good. always very grateful to him for that. I, you know, I have kind of a love hate relationship with Mark. He was. Uh, I haven't had any contact with him despite attempts to over the years. Um, he has not returned any of my messages or, or letters or emails. Um, and I, you know, I know he's busy, but um, I, he was always very kind to my mother and, and his books, and 
and I thought that dedicating that book to Vicky was, was, was very kind. You're listening to The Real Deal. We've got our special guest, Steve Martin, tonight. This is the new JFK show with Dr. James Fetzer, Larry Rivera, Gary King, and tonight, an incredible guest, Steve Martin. We'll be right back. Okay, uh, I wanted to uh, cover uh, more specific uh, areas of the JFK uh, assassination, the investigation, uh, Stephen, and uh, let's talk a little bit about the doorway issue and uh, Billy Lovelady, because I find this uh, portion of the show is going to be very, very fascinating, because, uh, well, let's, let's just hear it from you. Well, my... Um at, at that time, you know, there was rumor that there was a man in the building that looked very much like Lee, and um, and that, that there was, you know, the Altins photo was was available, and it was controversial. I mean, the man in that picture does look like Lee, and um, so there was a rumor that there was another gentleman in the building who bore a striking resemblance to Lee, but there were no photos known of him at the time, and. Um, one of the <laughs> um, one of the assignments, I guess, that my mother gave myself and my sister was to go around the back of the Texas School Book Building, Puzzlefair Building, and try to take pictures of the men standing. They'd all come. They they gather at lunchtime out on the loading dock, and they'd eat their lunch and drink their sodas. And so my sister and I, Teresa and I, went back behind the building. Uh, relatively close to the loading dock and we each had cameras although certainly not state-of-the-art um, you know they were family cameras at the time you know Kodaks that sort of thing um, certainly not anything with a fast shutter or uh, dependable you know dependable in any way um, so we went back there while my mother waited out front um, and we walked past the loading dock and there were a number of men out there on the loading dock, as we knew there would be, eating their lunches and drinking their sodas. And before we left, I, you know, I said, "Well, what does what does Love Lady look like?" And my mom said, "Honey, he looks just like Lee." And so we went back there with, you know, deliberate, you know, looking for someone that looked like Lee Oswald. And it was very clear when we got there that that was Billy Love Lady. I mean, he looked a lot like Lee. And we were, I remember, and my sister and I have talked about this, she has a better memory of it than I do, but they were making fun of us and jeering at us, kind of, not, not in a mean way, really, but just kind of, you know, laughing and, uh, you know, hooting a little bit. And as we walked closer, we, we took pictures uh, of the group of men, one of whom was Billy Lovelady. And um, as it turns out... Um, no, the pictures did not turn out. <laughs> and, you know, probably our skill level and probably the type of camera and the nervousness of it all. Um, but the pictures did not turn out at all. They were just kind of blurry images when we had them developed, um, which was unfortunate because there was not a picture of Love Lady for quite a while. Um, That's right. My mother and Penn Jones, I believe, even hired a private detective um, to take pictures, uh, try to get pictures of Love Lady, and he had all sorts of problems. And he came back and saying, "I'm just not going to do this. It's too dangerous." I think well, there was there. A, there was a there was a gentleman, uh, Jones Harris, who actually hired somebody by the name of Beckham to go and take a picture of Love yeah. Lady, and, and there was a was fight. After, yeah. yeah, I think that was after my mom and Jones hired him. I believe H hired another private investigator. I, again, it's kind of sketchy in my mind, but I believe there were two attempts, and it, none of them worked out. And I think the, I, I just remember that that private detective telling my mom, "It's just too dangerous. I'm not going to do it." Oh, they arrested him, and they uh, told him get out of town or else. <laughs> yeah, this might have been the same incident. Maybe they were all involved in it in some way. I'm not sure, but it was an interesting. Um, Interesting moment, and I still remember looking at the man that looked just like Lee. Well, well, what, what was her opinion about the man in the doorway? Well, you know, as I as I look back on it, um, my mom and I would argue a lot, and, and you know, not angry argue, but we would go back and forth about many things about the assassination. Uh, and of course, she was the expert, and it was hard to win with her um, because she had, you know, an, an encyclopedic knowledge of of everything relating to the Kennedy assassination, at least 
of what was known then. You know, she was an expert on the evidence. You know, the and the and the, the physical evidence and the the evidence that didn't exist and the evidence that did exist. And she was very interested in in, in the Alchin's photo. Um, and. I don't know how she felt about it later in life because we we didn't discuss it as much later in life. But certainly, you know, years after the the assassination, she still believed that um, that was Lee in the doorway, and wow. I and I believed it was Love Lady, and so we would argue back and forth about it and look at pictures and um, and she. She, at least for much of her life, um, believed that it was um, Oswald in the doorway. Well, she had devoured uh, Weisberg's books, uh, Whitewash 1 and 2, and uh, as you know, in Whitewash 2, there are two, uh, uh, then these are chapters, these are chapters from Weisberg's book that are still uh, relevant today, which were the Love Lady Caper, they're named, one is the Love Lady Caper, the other one is the Love Lady Diversion. And I'm sure that uh, she was well aware of, of all the information that Weisberg advanced uh, in, in, the, in, the, in that book. And all I could say to her when, when, she was, when she was talking in that way, and again, I don't know if she remained so adamant that it was Lee, but all I could say to her in, in my final attempt to win the argument uh, was, well, you didn't see him, I did. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. Right, I'll check that one up for you then. Uh, well, it was a long time ago, and you know, yes. memories, memories fade. Uh, now, now, uh, now, Steve, I understand that uh, after a while she had problems uh, with some of these witnesses who, uh, after a while, started to den deny uh, ever talking to her. What, uh, what what's up with that? The only one that I know that was a flat denial um, was Father Huber, the, the gentleman that gave the last rights to, to the president. Right, right. So, so what did she start, uh, you know, what, what was the plan uh, when that started to happen? But tell me all about it. Well, we all we were all in on that one. You know, the, I, I think the only person missing was our small dog, Poochie. Uh, when when she interviewed Father Huber, uh, I believe that my sister Vicky had the tape recorder at that time in her purse. Um, and keep in mind, tape recorders weren't what they are today. You know, they were they were somewhat bulkier, and they had wires and all sorts of things. Uh, and so she had a, she would weave it up through the the handles of her purse. And whoever was was mic'd uh, had to sit very close to the subject. Um, well, those are, all, yeah. those are also, you know, sort of larger machines, you know, at that time they, they were. were. I uh, mean, they, they were, we, we finally got a hold of a relatively small wire tape recorder that I, I think Mark Lane gave, provided my mom, but I'm not sure. Okay. But it was relatively small, but still not small by today's standards. But she interviewed Father Huber. And, you know, now, we were, now, who was this Father Huber? Uh, tell our audience who Father well, Huber was. Father Oscar Huber was the, was the person who gave last rites to, to the president at Parkland. And uh, he was there, you know, after the president had died. I mean, for all practical purposes, Kennedy was dead, you know, the moment his, uh, the head shot. Um, but for a while, he still had life signs. Um, but he gave the last rites to, to Kennedy uh, at the hospital. And it was... The reason my mother was interviewing him was, one, we were devout Catholics at the time, um, and two, she thought it was a, uh, thought that he was an excellent witness to the hit wounds. And during the interview, um, she asked him what he saw. And my sister and I have talked about this many times. Uh, when, when he talked about the wounds, he said there was a wound over Kennedy's left eye, and he touched his head with his with his le with his hand right over the left eyebrow. Um, and you know, to us that was to my mom that was you know a, a pretty astounding you know revelation. And later, uh, when she began you know writing letters about this and explaining it, and I don't really remember how Father Huber found out or who went back to talk to Father Huber, but he denied ever having talked to us. There was an article published in the New York World Journal Tribune, I believe. Okay, okay. And uh, so Father Huber denied ever talking to my mom. And, of course, um, it, was a, it was kind of a silly denial had he known that, 
the entire interview had been recorded. Um, so my mom, you know, all of us, you know, were deeply disappointed that, you know, a Catholic priest who we had, you know, learned to think were, I mean, we've, we've learned a little differently over the years, but, you know, back then Catholic priests were, you know, sitting at the right hand of God practically um, and could not make mistakes like that. Um, and I think there's a lot of disappointment there, but she wrote, um, a, and, I, and again, was I guess it was in the same article where she made some sort of statement about only God and Father Huber know the truth. Yes. Uh, but I know what Father Huber told me. Yes. Uh, and you know, it was it was just a disappointment, I think. You know, and I and I think Father Huber, to be fair, he was probably pressured pretty. Um, and later he said that. It, I, I think to cover up what he was saying originally is that that it must have been a blood clot over his left eye. Right. You know, maybe. Uh, but at the time, he said that there was a wound, there was a bullet wound above his left eye, and he touched his forehead as he said it. So. And she, and, and she published uh, an open letter, editorial, uh, in the Midlothian Mirror uh, with Penn Jones. Uh, oh, did she? Yeah, I, that's, she does yeah. quite a few articles with Tim Jones and Midlow. Yeah, 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 calling out the the, the father, uh, Father Huber. Well, was, you know, she was pretty angry. You know, uh, I, I would be too. <laughs> she she didn't like being, as she said in the letter, she doesn't like being called a liar, especially when she can prove it. Right. Uh, right. So, you know, it was just sort of disappointing, and I don't really blame Father Huber. You know, may he rest in peace, because I know he's not around anymore. Of um, not. But he was probably under pressure. You know, there was a lot of pressure of the witnesses at that time. Um, yeah, no, oddly no, enough, uh, yeah go, go ahead, go ahead. Oddly enough, some of, you know, his, his statement kind of goes along with some of the statements of the doctors that were at Parkland, you know? Yes. Um, so, you know, what's true and what isn't, it's, you know, it's hard to know. What's black, black is white and white is black. In fact, we have a very uh, comprehensive article on Veterans Today that was published on Sunday about uh, the, uh, partially about what the doctor saw at Parkland because we have uh, located uh, Zapruder frame 343, which amazingly enough uh, was never, they, they did not catch uh, the blowout in the back of the head. That was that was is very evident, and we have done uh, computer enhancements on that frame, and it's you know it's very obvious that uh, there's a blowout to the back of the head uh, there. Uh, I think that it was obvious in the first, you know, in there, you know, I think it was just obvious all along that he was shot from the front. But mm -hmm. um, now, now uh, I just wanted to finish uh, the portion here of uh, tape recording conversations and whatnot, and they used to uh, so microphones into uh, your jacket uh well, what was that about, about nick did, yeah did we talk about the officer mcdonald yet no 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 yeah. it's, uh, i want to go into that now yeah okay yeah my the, you know the reason i think that my mother thought that it was necessary to record things somewhat surreptitiously is uh people were not all that anxious to talk about you know what they had seen and what they had heard uh, there was a there was a kind of an aura of fear uh, already, you know, circulating around that, and you know, some people just don't want to get involved. And so, my mother, with her, you know, four children and often small dog in tow, was 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 probably pretty, you know, off putting. Uh, I mean, in in a good way. I mean, people probably didn't. She was probably, you know, less intimidating than an FBI agent, for example. Right. And people were often willing to talk to her, but she still wanted records, you know, of of what she, and I and I think that many of these people, as they said, I'm tape. If if she had said I'm tape recording you, simply would have refused to talk. Right. And I don't know what the legalities of of that are uh, now. Um, whether or not, you know, it it varies from state to state about how you can record people. I have no idea what the laws on it were then, mm -hmm. um, but it was a pretty widespread. People used did it quite often, um, and so I don't know if it was legally an issue or not. We never really thought about that, I don't think. Um, but yeah, we. I remember the one time, at least one time, that I remember that I was the that I was the chosen tape recorder handler, um, and my mom had sewn the tape recorder inside a jacket I was wearing, and run the the microphone up through my sleeve. Um, and in order, because the the, the uh, 
technology was not very great in those days. Whoever the subject was had to be pretty close to the person with the microphone. Um, and I remember in, uh, her interviewing, uh, I believe his name was Nick McDonald. Yeah, Nick McDonald, yeah. yeah. The officer that arrested Oswald in the theater. And right. the story remained pretty consistent throughout time. Um, but I remember sitting uncomfortably close to this police officer um, while my mother interviewed him, um, feeling quite awkward that I was sitting, you know, within, you know, several inches of him probably on the couch. Um, and I'm sure he was wondering why in the hell I was sitting so close to him. Uh, oh, that, that is a wonderful anecdote. It's wonderful. He, um, his, like I said, his story stayed pretty consistent throughout. You know, as police statements often do, they, you know, they're very concise. They're very brief. They don't try to elaborate too much because if you if you try to give too many details, you get you know the facts can get confused, and you can get confused about what you said. His story was always very brief and to the point. You know, uh, you know, it's all over now, according to him. What Oswald said, and the only thing that I remember that he told us, and I and I've remembered this for years, that. I did not ever see quite the same way again was he demonstrated to us how when he reached for the gun and Oswald allegedly fired the gun at him, he, he pointed to the webbing between his uh, thumb and index finger and he told us the hammer of the gun came down on the webbing of his hand. Yes. Um, I never saw him say that again. Uh, other than say things like I felt it, uh, I, I felt the hammer um, whisk against my skin or something like that. But he never actually said that it came down on. And is that important? No, it's meaningless because it's the same thing, I guess. Uh, but it was interesting because it gave me a visual, um, and I remember reenacting it with my brother. You would know. have been very painful, that's for sure. Yeah, it would have been, but it would have stopped the firing. You know, it certainly mm -hmm. would have caused the so it wasn't actually a misfire it was a it was something coming between the hammer and the shell um but uh, you know other than that he, uh, his, again his story has always been very consistent about what happened and that's the way police officers are you know they don't elaborate it's these are the facts this is what happened and i have no reason really to i never really doubted nick mcdonald uh you know it's all over now what does that mean I don't know. I might say it if suddenly I'd realize that I'd been set up as an assassin, mm -hmm. um, and which I think Lee did. I, you know, I think somewhere not long after the assassination, he said, "Oh shit, um, this is this is not good," <laughs> uh, and and wanted to get away from there. Um, I still think he was innocent, but I think he probably knew more than we knew know about his involvement in certain things um, and um, but I still think he was innocent um, and I think my mother recorded things just you know I think she wanted to save them um, but she never did you know most of the tape recordings were sent on I still have a couple of tape recordings in my closet um, addressed to Vince Salandria mm -hmm. uh, back in 64 I think it was and I have no idea what's on them. I think they're both from that wire tape recorder. Oh, and I have no idea. How, yeah, I have no idea how to even find out what's on them. <laughs> you know. Um, well, uh, you just mentioned that your mother could possibly intimidate some of these people, or they were frightened. Uh, and I know for a fact that uh, Joe Molina, for example, who was standing in the doorway. And uh, black tie man. yeah, yeah. She uh, he insisted that he was black tie man, but uh, your mother sort of did not uh, believe him. Uh, yeah, and you know, I have a, I have a very um, dim memory of discussing Joe Molina with her at one time. And well, first of all, he was a very short individual. He was only like five feet tall. Yeah, and I don't think my mother intimidated people. I think she didn't intimidate them, and that's why they talked to her. But I think there was a lot of intimidation going on at that time, and people were afraid. But the only thing I remember about Joe Molina, and I'm, I, you know, this is one of the areas where I may have it completely wrong, but my mother never talked about who killed Kennedy. Uh, she only talked about who didn't kill Kennedy. 
she was she was interested only in Oswald's innocence, and the, her only interest in who might have done it would have been in efforts to clear Lee. Um, but she was never, you know, she was never a proponent of one theory over the, over another. She just believed Lee was innocent. But the only time I ever heard her talk about who I who she thought might have killed Kennedy. And it wasn't on very many occasions. It was just a few occasions that she talked about this. So I don't think it was a really strong belief. But she said she believed that it was probably uh, a small town kind of conspiracy, a good old boy kind of conspiracy to kill Kennedy, Mm -hmm. rather than, you know, a vast, you know, CIA plot. Well, I think we've learned more about the CIA since, and, you know, I think her thinking probably would have changed, or probably did change. But I, in my mind, Joe Molina was somebody she was interested in as a possible one of these one of these good old boy conspirators. Now, right. I don't know that as a fact, but I do know he belonged to some sort of kind of gun club or something. Um, a GI forum is what it was. Something so. like that. It was it was yeah. some sort of, and I do know that he had some issues after he was actually almost arrested. Well, he, uh, actually, uh, that same night of uh, November 22nd, uh, the top brass of the police department department paid him a visit at 1.30 in the morning and woke him up. And they were looking for anything that could tie him into uh, with Lee Oswald. So that same night, it just goes to show that they were looking for other uh, co-conspirators right. uh, along with Lee Oswald. So they had not, at the time, yet decided to pin this all on just this one uh, man. And I also wanted to comment that uh, that you were talking about uh, that she knew who didn't kill Kennedy and that probably uh, had the league been given his date in, day in court, that he probably would have been uh, an innocent man. You know, we, my mom and I used to argue about that, too. And she felt that if he, Lee had, given, had had a chance to... Uh, go to trial and and um, and have a decent attorney like the one he was requesting um, until they killed him. Um, that he she thinks he would have got she thought that he probably would have gotten off. I always felt differently. I always felt that the atmosphere in in Dallas at that time was, you know, they were going to get him no matter what. They were going to they were going to find him guilty no matter what. Um, you know, I'd I'd like to think, and I think if they had the trial now, I think that would be a different thing. But I'm not sure he would have um, done well in a trial then. Mm-hmm. Um, people were so hate-filled, you know, about him at the time um, that I'm just not sure he ever could have gotten a fair trial. Certainly not in Dallas. Uh, I think the media had a lot to do with that, also. Yeah, Steve. I'm sure they did. They, um, you know, it was it was what everybody was being told to believe. Right. And uh, you know, who are who are the who are we? You know, to disbelieve the FBI and the CIA and the Dallas police, and um, and you know, there were a few people who said, "No, we we don't want to believe this." You know, my mom, Vince Delandria, Mark Lane, um, and um, it's you know, I often think about what we've accomplished, what the what the people who believe in Lee's innocence have accomplished over the years, and. I think all they have done is put a kind of an asterisk in the in the in the history books yeah. that say many people believe that Lee Oswald was innocent. Well, at least now they say alleged assassin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some people, you know, it's it's become kind of in 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 vogue to to go with the main line now or the main line, you know, the Warren Commission story. It's kind of about the risque thing to do now by some people because they think that it makes them above stand above the crowd if they go back to the old school idea. Right. Um, so now, there's still people out there fighting, you know. There's still people out there fighting. Now, now uh, in 1964, uh, uh, your mother actually was visited by FBI agents, uh, for example, in September of 1964. Uh, she sent a telegram to the Warren Commission and to uh, Commission uh, Warren Commissioner Rankin, and uh, and they came out to see her. And uh, I read uh, in this document where your dogs were growling at these agents, and uh, and uh, you know what? Uh, do you remember that incident? 
You know, I, 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 I remember the FBI coming a couple of times. One was in response to that uh, memo about, or her, her, tele, her telegraph to Rankin about uh, the Mammoth and Karna rifle not being capable of, of, of the timing of the shots, etc. And um, I believe that was the one where the dogs were involved. Um, mm-hmm. And we had lots of dogs. We lived out in the country, and we had lots of dogs. And it was twelve. <laughs> we had a bunch. Yeah, we had we had a number of dogs. And uh, the um, they it, it, this time they they didn't seem intimidated. And I, I guess they assumed they'd probably just shoot them if they attacked. But uh, they they did come into the house, and it was typical of my mother's behavior uh, and her. I mean, she viewed their visits as first of all, she didn't write a telegram to the FBI. She wrote a telegram to the to the Warren Commission. Uh, right, 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 right. So she viewed this as another form of intimidation, I'm sure. And as I mentioned before, my mom just could not stand, you know, wielding people using their authority inappropriately. And although the agents were quite nice, you know, they were quite polite. I, I do think it was a form of intimidation, you know, coming to a small ho- home in Oklahoma where all the neighbors can see that the FBI is coming up. Um, I think that is a form of intimidation, and she tended to toy with people some, um, and she toyed with them a bit uh, and would not discuss um, the telegram with them, I believe, because she didn't think that they were, she, she didn't think that they were valid uh, messengers of of the Warren Commission, um, and it was kind of typical of my mother to you know to kind of in your face with authority, um, right. and you know many many of her children got the same got the same um, um, genetic code somehow. <laughs> so we we earned it honestly. Um, but yeah, they uh, nothing came of that. When I know that the other time the FBI came, it was in reference to a photograph that she saw. Yes, yes, that's what I, exactly. That's a segue into this, uh, and I this is something that's going to be fascinating here for our audience. Uh, and uh, go right on ahead. Well, um, in December for mid December, I think it was December December fourteenth issue, sixty three issue of Life magazine. It was Saturday Evening Post. The Saturday, Saturday Evening Post. Post. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Saturday Evening yeah. Post. I've got a copy of it right here, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Um, the, um, there was a picture that has become famous over the years for, for other reasons, but it's a picture of the motorcade going down uh, Stemmons Freeway. It's known as the Miller Photograph. Yeah, a young man, I think he was only 15 years old or something, um, took that photograph. Um, I can't remember. David Miller, I think his name was. Yeah, uh, the Corham Motors photo also is. It's also known as a either yeah. either one. But um, as we were looking at the picture, that was well known because it, at first it was publicized that there there was a foot sticking out of the limousine. Right, right. Tell us about that. Yeah. yeah. And at first. Um, it was thought that that was Kennedy's foot, which, if you think about it, was probably not possible, because you know after the headshot, his motor functions were gone. He it would have been difficult for his leg to come up over the top. And as it turned out, it was um, it was the Secret Service man's foot. Uh, but at first, people thought it was Kennedy's foot, and they thought it was such a poignant shot, you know, you know the dead president's foot hanging over the side of the motorcade, and that's how the picture got kind of famous um, but when my mom was looking at Saturday Evening Post she happened to notice that up in the right hand top of it there was a rooftop which we have always called Corum Motors but could have been Corum something else it could have been a, I think you told me at one point it could have been a flower shop in one of our yeah places. yes yes but uh, yes but then yeah go ahead, go ahead. I'll explain that yeah, I don't know why in all our in all her correspondence it was Corum Motors. That's how we've always called it. It was definitely a Corum building. No, it was it was Corum Motors. The problem was that the uh, directory that I got a hold of in 1964 for some, and this is really mysterious, that uh, the entire Corham Motors company disappeared. Okay, yeah, and again, I, I'm pretty sure it was Corum Motors at the time because that's what we called it. And uh, but. Whatever it was, whatever the building was called, it was right uh, on on the roof of Corum Motors uh, was an image that appears to be a man running with a rifle, and 
Um, my mom sent a telegram to the Warren Commission again saying, you know, what's going on here? This looks like a man with a rifle. Um, we then got a visit from the FBI. Um, they looked at the photograph, agreed that it looked just like a man with a rifle, but didn't say anything more about it. And during the next trip to Dallas, we went there and we, we looked at the building. There was nothing on the building that could possibly have been what was in that picture. So whatever it was was, was now gone. And she took pictures, obviously. She took pictures, although those pictures, you know, so much was lost over the years. Those pictures don't exist anymore, at least as far as I know. She may have sent them to somebody. Mm -hmm. But um, there is definitely someone, something that appears to be a man running with a rifle that was not there a number of months later. That's right. Uh, when, when we went to look. Um, we, I have over the years tried to get some people interested in it. I even contacted Robert Groden at one point trying to get his, you know, his take on it. And I, I never, I, I sent it to Vince Salandri at one point, uh, not too long ago, as a matter of fact, four or five years ago, probably. Yeah. And, uh, and he told me it looked like a, he, it looked like a stovepipe to him. Oh, sure. right. Thanks, Vince. Uh, right. <laughs> but uh, it wasn't a stovepipe. It, it appears to be a man running with a rifle. And why? I don't know, but it certainly, you know, with all the interest that has been done, you know, all the investigation into the figures on the, the alleged figures on the grassy knoll, uh, it seems like somebody would be interested um, in looking at that picture. Then I finally, you know, sent it to you guys, and, and you did take a look at it. Yeah. And uh, the problem is, with no, with no negative of the picture, it's tough. The Running Man was a was a was a photograph uh, that I, for years, tried to get people interested in, and nobody seemed to care much about it. Although I thought it was a pretty obvious uh, indication that there were more people that day with guns, um, and I don't know why there has been such a lack of interest. I think possibly because. If he were shooting from that spot, if he had needed to shoot from that spot, it would have been a very difficult shot. For one well, thing. there was a stadium called Cop Stadium right in front of there, and uh, apparently the street, I think, from yeah, and and there was another uh, man with a rifle scene, uh, and uh, thirty that afternoon, I believe. Right, um, right, yeah, but they could have they could have fudged the uh, the, the time, you know. To, you well, know, he could have been, or, as my mother pointed out one time, he could have been, you know, hiding until, you know, the heat was down. Right. Bit. And that would have been a cross, another point of crossfire there. And, now, know, I, as, I, I've, as I've often thought, you know, once Kennedy drove into Dealey Plaza, he was not getting out of there alive. And oh, it was yeah. not because there was one rifle up in the sixth floor window. Right, so, right. Um, but I, if, um, you know, if anybody's interested, you know, take a look at that. I think you'd have some stuff on your side about it. Yes. Uh, it's fascinating. You know, it is fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Now, in in the 80s, uh, you actually got your hands on a Mandelik or Carcano uh, uh, for uh, your mother. Tell us all about that. Yeah. Very strange birthday present for a mother, but I searched the uh, gun stores in, um, in Tulsa a until I found one. And, of course, um, when, when I walked in asking for that particular rifle, I'm sure the price went up dramatically. Um, knowing that I was looking for a particular rifle, but I did finally buy one. In fact, I'm, I'm, it's right here in front of me as I speak because uh, I got it when my mom passed away. And uh, she was interested in it because she was always sure. Um, she was always fascinated with, with uh, Frazier's testimony about the package uh, being, too, um, being too long short to be a rifle. Right, too short, um, right, right. And um, so she, with my help, you know, we took it apart, and um, and sure enough, I mean, there's just no way that um, it would have fit as he said he was the way he said Fraser said he was carrying a rifle. Yeah, a under, his arm under his armpit. Yeah. Yeah, and and so it was just one of those things that uh, you know I'm I'm sure I'm one of the very few sons in history who has bought their mother an assassination rifle for Christmas. <laughs> uh, but, she, but she loved it. Uh, it was a great gift. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Steve, uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you. I just wanted to finish this fascin fascinating interview uh, with a quote that I have here from the Oklahoma City Times, and uh, just give us your thoughts on it. And uh, it, it ends like this. Uh, 
and they're talking about your mother and where she she was quoted as saying for my family and i hope ordinary citizens will become interested enough to demand the answers to the questions puzzling me uh what what uh what are your thoughts about that uh, well i i think that for her family what she meant is she wanted us to understand the difference between right and wrong you know in a very you know i mean it's the simplistic way of putting it but my mom was very concerned. She hated injustice. She hated injustice of any kind, big, small. And this was a huge injustice. If, if, um, if Lee Oswald was innocent of the assassination, then the real crime, the real tragedy that day was not John Kennedy's death. He's gone down in history as a you know a white knight, uh, uh, picked off in his prime. And uh, but Lee Oswald was ruined. And that's how she felt, too. Lee Oswald was destroyed by this. Even if he had lived, he would have been destroyed. But he, if, if he was innocent, then the real crime that day was what happened to Lee. Right. And uh, she wanted people to know that. And I think that her and those early researchers, I think they went a long way to, to getting people to start thinking about it. You know, we had high hopes for the House Select Committee in the 70s. But, you know, they were they were bought off eventually too um and they throw, threw us a small crumb of saying that it was a probable conspiracy based on the audio records um but they didn't that wasn't there was nothing of you know there was no meat in there um and will there ever be another investigation i don't know we might have to be satisfied with the fact that the majority of the people in this country probably in the world feel that uh those early researchers were right that something was wrong and um their their efforts and and the people who continue their efforts like you and many others um continue to sway people in that direction will we ever know the truth well i think i think we do know the truth uh i just don't think that anything will ever come of us knowing the truth well, Steve, I want to thank you very, very much for being such a wonderful guest, and you have really, really opened up the eyes here of many, many of our guests who have been going to be listening to this fascinating story about Shirley Martin, your mother, and thank you again, Steve, and thank you all for tuning in. Thank you.